The creatures are interesting because there's many of them. I mean, season seven was nuts. There was just wall-to-wall -wall stuff. And each one has their own story. You know, the dragons have been interesting because I don't know of any other series or situation where one has had to have their sound design grow up over the years as the dragons go from, you know, this big to 747s, you know. So um, that has been a really interesting sound, sound challenge. Um, just physically changing and transforming the sounds, you know, as a baby or a puppy, you know, a dog or whatever who is young makes certain vocalizations, you will recognize certain vocal patterns, cadences, whatever, when that puppy or baby is full grown, right? So it's again, it's the same kind of strategy. Um, it's not just taking and pitching down, taking and pitching down. I mean, each year I'll do a little bit of that, obviously, because you're filling out, you know, trying to make the sound bigger. But it's also introducing new elements that, you know, indicate largeness, indicate, um, um, uh, you know, more of an adult, uh, kind of stance and um, and the other thing that I do is I create stories for myself. I mean essentially when you're doing creatures you're almost creating performances, you know? And I use all animal sounds in mine almost like a mosaic, little tiny pieces that are placed together that are bouncing off the visuals and creating an emotional character for the dragons but each dragon for me has a personality so in my mind i tell a story so drogon who is named after khaleesi's very hot husband from season one cal drogo you know i see him as the reincarnation of drogo which leads to a very sensual almost sexual relationship between the two. And when you listen to the sounds, you know, she's crawling, you know, it's like a before Battle of the Bastards, she walks up and gets on top of Drogon and then they go and burn things down. You hear him almost, it not, it's not a whistle, but it's a little purr and it's a thing for her because they have that relationship and it makes, a ve makes it very intimate and it makes it very, very special where the other two dragons, Regal and Viserion, um, I refer to as Beavis and Butthead. You know, they're very goofy. And, um, and the basement sequence, you know, at the end of Real Four is, is, you know, you see them and they're goofy and it's like, hey, goats. And then Mama chains them and leaves and they become, inc it's incredibly painful at the end. You know, it, it, it is, um, it's emotional and it's tragic and so you see them turn and, and respond to her in the situation. And so you, it's really, I mean, it's full with emotion, it's full of, of personality. And, and, and so stories like that, that you tell yourself that are, it's like a backstory or whatever, help to drive choice making in sound because sound is so vast. And the, the choices are, I mean, they're infinite. And for me, anyway, I, I can get easily overwhelmed by the possibility of starting a new project. Where do you start? And I start with a, a little story, you know, and start to hunt for things that when I hear them, emote. And, you know, the other thing with animals is, you know, it was sort of, I remember having this conversation with one of the producers, you know, it's like when you go to a zoo, you know, you expect to hear the lions roar and, you know, things like that. But it's, you know, and they roar and, and, and you know, dogs bark, and, you know, but it's the cool little sounds they make that have nothing to do with the, you know, it's like all the little chuffs and, and they're emoting in those things. They're communicating in their own way with each other. Um, it is those things that, are, that interest me, that, that, ex, that are expressions of their, you know, inner world in a way. Um, or, as, or as I imagine it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously anthropomorphizing the dragons, but, you know, we don't know how dragons sound, but I do know that my dogs give me great emotional communication all the time. You know, they express themselves, you know, they're happy, they're sad, they're, you know, intimidated and, and, and listening for the emotional content in all animals and picking little bits and pieces to form this mystical creature that no one has ever heard before um, is kind of my approach. And I approach all the creatures in different ways. You know, the white walkers, 
they had had a, a language developed for them initially, and they, they were going to speak. And we tried it, it just didn't work, and it felt like the White Walkers were above language. Um, so I came, kind of came up with the idea that as they walk, they freeze everything in their path, and they control the forces of nature. So when they arrive, before you see them, you hear them in the kind of almost twisting of you know the mountains and the universe. You hear this insane power um, that sounds very atmospheric, but it's 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 them. In my mind, it's them controlling all these forces and making them very formidable without ever speaking, which is very kind of a cool. Um, it, it, it has ended up being a very cool presence uh, in the course of in the course of the show. So, so like I said, I mean, each creature is like that. I mean, I really kind of try to think of something really interesting for them. So they have there's a, there's an internal logic to each character, and I think when you do that, you know, it helps the audience lean in a little closer. Um, it helps you feel a little more connected. I mean, it's really interesting. And that kind of has come from years of playing and experimenting to see how people respond to different kind of pieces of work. And, um, and Game of Thrones has been great because, you know, people are very responsive. So you hear all kinds of, you know, theories and, and, and uh, you know, criticisms maybe, you know, or whatever, but I can tell when something's working really well and, and when maybe something needs a little bit more attention. I, I can't work like that, you know. It's, it doesn't make sense to me because you're not attaching it to anything. I mean, you cannot, for me, I can't separate the visual. I mean, they all go hand in hand, you know. So, but what I do see is, I mean, Game of Thrones is unique. I, I think more people are doing it now, but at the time, you know, when it started, it has been unique because they shoot it like a you know, well, when it was 10 episodes, now it's obviously been a little less the last couple of years, but it's like a 10-hour like a feature film. And when I see the season at the beginning, rough as it may be, assembled as it may be, animatics are in there, very rough previs, et cetera, et cetera, I see the entire arc of the season. And that's extremely important because planning and figuring out how things are gonna unfold and planning ahead to another season also. You know, I have to open, like, the the ice dragon, you know, when Viserion turns into a, a white dragon, basically. Um, uh, in creating that, I also planned for next year because I don't know what's coming, but in my wildest dreams, it's going to be the Battle of Fire and Ice, and it and and frankly, I'm sure Dan and David will come up with something more crazy than that. But even if it's just that, I had to figure out that the fire and the calls and the, the body and the, and the vocals were one thing, but what do you do with the fire? And I came up with a very unique kind of approach to it that is very distinct, sounds very distinctly different than normal fire breathing. And that's the kind of thing, I mean, even with something like that, I, I have learned to not let it as a dangling thread and hope for the best next year. It's like, no, I want to plan because I don't want to get backed into a corner and go, oh dear, I, you know, because, because, you know, part of the thing is, I mean, I can, you know, seasons, it comes and I decide to change something up, it's fine, but the fans are so on it and the people who watch it are so on it, they're going to notice if something has shifted and it's not congruent with the last season and it's extremely important to not take people out of the story by them going wait a minute that didn't sound like that before and pe and the f people will do that and I mean this is ultimately to give pleasure to the people who are watching for them to enjoy so you really want to be have integrity in in the design and that involves a lot of forward planning also challenges are just coming up with things that nobody's ever heard before you know and it's really what they ask all the time you know, I've had, I remember when I started, you know, I would do some sketches and I do, I have a, uh, a technique where I will, you know, create a scene and crash it down to a quick time and send it off. And then the, the creative team can, you know, creative heads can listen and decide and, you know, comment back. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I nailed it. It's going to be so good. They're going to love this. And then, you know, the comment will be, yeah, it's cool, but 
not really special. And I remember hearing that maybe twice. And that's all it ever had to be because I know what they're gonna say and I know they want it special and I want it to be special. So my challenge, you know, like the, when I saw the animatics for the blue fire, I was like, oh my God. And I searched for ideas. What was I, what story would I tell myself to really get into a different space to introduce something really unusual? And the story I told myself with that was that the, uh, that the dragon's screams on the blue fire were the cries of the souls of the dead army. So that there's this one shot where they're all standing there and they're mute with their dead eyes and the dragon is blowing the wall down with the blue fire. And that shot for me was about that, that he was speaking on behalf of them. And it adds, it's, it's a beautiful kind of idea a, it helps me then start to look for interesting ways to achieve that idea, but it adds to the mysticism of these creatures, which are which are very mystical. You know, they're they're, you know, did dragons even ever you know exist? I don't know, but they have this, they have this beauty and they have this um, power and they have this this depth. It feels like of history that. You know, I want to continue every time I introduce something to, to, to keep filling that out, to keep f so that you really feel that when you encounter the dragons. So when they show up, you feel that vast amount of, of depth. And uh, it's scary. I mean, I'm terrified for next season, honestly, because I don't know what they're dreaming up. But I've come to a place to trust myself that I'll find my way. I may fall on my face a few times, and that's okay because failure is a great teacher and it's a great way and, and experimentation. And they give me a lot of room to do that as they, Dan and David, who are the creators, do with everyone. You know, that's what Game of Thrones is Game of Thrones. They give us room to be creative, to offer our ideas. And then, you know, they say yay, nay, whatever. But uh, the fact that they give us this space in this gorgeous and trust us with that, and, th and that they do, and these two men are incredible incredible tour. I have never in my entire career worked with anybody like them. They are open, they're collaborative, they're respectful, they interact with everyone, it doesn't matter what your role is, and everybody I think feels that they want to make it special for them and for the incredible amount of people who have read the books, who love the show, you know, you don't want to disappoint. Um, so it's a very, I mean, it's, I, I feel the, res I think the biggest thing is I feel the responsibility of that and I want to give people things that make them go, oh, you know, and, and, you know, we don't, I mean, you don't always get there, but I think we, we do a pretty good job sometimes, so.